I mean, 12 years, that's a long time to lead an open source project. So I got my start with uh, open source back in 2003. And at the time uh, I was a software developer working with Microsoft technology. And I was really interested in learning about the new .NET platform because I'd been writing classic ASP applications up until that point. And so I jumped on a sample application that Microsoft had released called iBuySpy Portal. And I saw the potential for it. And I ended up transforming that into a more robust framework, which I later called .NET Nuke. I actually was the maintainer of that open source project from 2003 till 2014. So it was a bit more challenging in the early stages. In fact, some of the early contributors to the project didn't even know what source control was. I remember it was, it was pretty challenging. And then uh, CodePlex was a thing. In fact, even before CodePlex, there was something called got.net that provided some source control management capabilities. And so managing the project was much different than it is today with more modern tooling like uh, GitHub. And then it became a real open source project. And, and that's when the fun really began. And you know that obviously carried it forward. I don't think I knew what I was getting into in those early stages. I knew that I, I had created an application that made it easy for other people to build web, web applications on .NET as it provided a lot of the of the fundamental aspects that you need in any web application. So I knew that there was value there, but as far as, you know, basically creating a whole career out of that, which is what ended up happening, uh, I had never imagined that would happen. Uh, I was a .NET developer. I had created a web application framework, um, which was fairly dynamic. And then Microsoft came along with SharePoint. Um, and SharePoint shared a lot of similar characteristics in the sense that you could use SharePoint uh, to build dynamic web applications as well. I think what was interesting is, I think it was uh, 2004, Microsoft actually sponsored me. So basically, I think I was one of the very first open source projects that they ever sponsored because they liked what I was doing and they liked the fact that the community was getting involved. And especially the ASP.NET team, uh, which was headed up by Scott Guthrie at the time, was very keen on open source and developer involvement. And so, I mean, Microsoft funded at least myself to work full-time on, on this open source project at the same time that they were, you know, promoting SharePoint commercially. I, I don't think they ever really saw uh, .NET Nuke as a huge threat. And in fact, SharePoint grew to be a massive business. But then after that second year, they basically said, well, at this point, you know, you should figure out your own revenue model, your own business model to make it self-sustaining because, you know, this funding that you're basically getting from us is going to stop soon. <laughs> I had to think long and hard about, you know, how I was going to convert this into a real business. Luckily, .NET Nuke was built with extensibility in mind, and there was a commercial ecosystem of extensions that had been built. And so that provided one aspect of a business model going forward. But eventually, I guess it was around 2006, I, I teamed up with three of the core team members, uh, and we created actually a, a company called .NET Nuke Corporation. Of course, grew very rapidly, uh, and I was with the company until 2014. Licensing is always a very important topic when it comes to open source. When I originally released the first version of .NET Nuke, which was called the iBuySpy Workshop, I, I actually released it sort of under a public domain type license because I wasn't really familiar with open source licensing at the time. And then when I actually had a later conversation with, actually with Scott Guthrie from Microsoft, he said, you know, you really need to choose a, an open source license for this application, one that's, you know, a more standard license and one that spells out, you know, the roles and responsibilities and much more clearly. Uh, and so I did my research and at the time I chose the MIT license, which is one of the more, most permissive licenses. Uh, and that actually is the license that .NET Nuke remained under. And as far as open source goes, actually in, I guess it was 2018, I got really excited about the, the new .NET Core based uh, laser platform that Microsoft released and started building a new modular web application framework on Blazor. Uh, and that's actually been released and it's called Octane. So I'm back being a maintainer of an open source project again. 
So I think when it comes to open source projects, if you develop a solution that solves a need that is a sort of fairly common amongst developers in the community, then you have a greater chance of attracting people who want to contribute. So of course that's not immediate. Usually it takes some time. Managing a, an open source product is no different than managing a commercial product in the sense that you, you have to do some promotion of it, right? You have to, you know, talk about it. You have to share a lot of knowledge through blogs and through articles and do interviews and talk about it at conferences. And so all the same things that you would do to, to market a commercial product you need to do for your open source project. And, and then you have a better chance, of course, of attracting the right people. I did become the chairman of the advisory council. And so I've actually been working closely with the .NET Foundation since 2014 as a volunteer, sort of providing you know, input and, and feedback and guidance along the way. So I think every, every open source foundation has a different value proposition. The .NET Foundation, I think initially Microsoft needed a way so that it could uh, collaborate with the community in a much more intimate manner. So this would both allow their employees to participate in open source, because that really wasn't possible in the early years, and also you know, allow the community to participate in the products that they create. And so creating a foundation and, and actually moving the IP to that foundation was a critical step in making that happen. But the foundation's mandate is much larger than that in that it also serves to be an umbrella for other .NET based open source projects. And so I think most of the notable .NET based open source projects today are members of the .NET foundation. And the foundation provides a number of key services to the community. Some of them are more technical type services, right? Code signing and supporting user groups. And, you know, there's a variety of things that it does in that regard. I think the other thing is that it is intended to ensure that open source projects, at least the, the projects that are the members of the foundation, will maintain the same level of freedom around, you know, the license of those projects indefinitely. Consumers of those open source projects can be assured that if they choose to use them, there's never going to be some risk that the license might change or the project will be abandoned. The foundation serves a role in that. I do view open source differently after spending so many years involved with it. I think that I've learned a lot along the way about some of the challenges. Like, I like to tell people that open source is a bit of a paradox um, because there's a lot of things that people believe that are true about open source that are in fact very contradictory. For example, I would say people like, for example, open source is a full-time job. And people often think that when you get involved in open source, it's just a very sort of volunteer effort. You know, you can invest a little bit of time here and there. The reality is, I mean, if you're the person who releases the initial open source project and you are in fact the primary maintainer, it is like an unpaid job that consumes most of your time, right? So most of the time that you have available, you will end up investing into that open source project in terms of maintaining it, spending time interacting with the various contributors of the project. I mean, it actually consumes so much of your time that I know a number of maintainers of open source projects that eventually get burned out, right? They get what's called maintainer fatigue, right? They spend so much time and they're so focused on their project that some other aspects of their life end up suffering because of it. And this is an aspect of open source that I don't think people understand, right? They just think it's a lot of volunteers contributing a little bit of time here and there and, and producing magical results. But I mean, there are some people investing blood, sweat, and tears behind these open source projects and it does take a lot of time. I think another paradox is that often when you start an open source project, you, you're just trying to get a few contributors to help out, right? You're just, you're just hoping that you get a few people who want to submit some pull requests and help you out and maybe fix a few bugs and, or, or maybe add a feature. And that's great initially. But if your project is successful, you know, the saying that success is harder than failure. If you start getting a lot of contributors, it becomes a full-time job just managing your contributors and giving them real-time sort of answers, right? When they ask questions and, and I mean, it consumes a ton of time. And so actually the more successful your open source project is, the more work it becomes as you get more contributors that, you know, that want to participate. I would also say that another paradox is that I'd say open source, 
open source is actually selfish. And I know that's a paradox because, I mean, people believe that if you're giving away your valuable intellectual property for free, that seems very selfless. But the reality is a lot of people get involved in open source because they have a very specific need that they want to solve, or they have a very specific feature that they want to add to your project, right? And that's very selfish. <laughs> or if they do a bunch of work, they do expect to get some recognition for that, right? So again, not selfless, but kind of selfish. But in the end, I think that anyone who participates in open source is clearly you know, providing a lot of value to the community at large. And so, I mean, we have to be very thankful for the efforts.